Good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to, wake, to welcome you all to the Mixer and Swinton webinar. This evening, as you well know, we have Dr. Susan Carteret, who graduated from Glasgow University with a BSc in Astronomy and Natural Philosophy, physics to most people. But if natural philosophy was good enough for Isaac Newton, then it's certainly good enough for Glasgow. She then did a PhD in particle physics, also at Glasgow, and worked in Hamburg, Germany and San Francisco before arriving in Sheffield in 1989. She is currently working on neutrino oscillations with the T2K experiment in Japan, which incidentally doesn't have any evidence that neutrinos travel faster than light, though it does have evidence that accelerators don't much like earthquakes. So please put your hands together and give our good expert Alice Winston welcome to Dr. Susan Cartwright. So, um, so tonight I am going to talk about the birth of cosmology and the birth of cosmology is essentially the process of discovering external galaxies. And it's quite an opportune time to do this because 2020 actually marks the centenary of one of the major events in this process of discovering external galaxies, the so-called great debate between Harlow Shapley and Heber Curtis. And um, we'll get onto that later in the talk. But I want to start from the beginning, and the beginning for galaxies is in the 18th century. Um, and in the 18th century, discovering comets was a popular sport among astronomers. Um, if you wanted to have your 15 minutes of fame, then the way you did it was to discover a comet. Um, now, how did you go about discovering a comet? Well, comets have two observational characteristics. One is that they are fuzzy because they have, um, as they approach the sun, the uh, surface um, ices evaporate and they develop this gaseous coma which can be very, very large. And so even in a quite small telescope, they will appear fuzzy rather than point like, like a star. And the other thing is that being members of the solar system, they will move from night to night relative to the fixed stars. Um, and therefore, if you are an 18th century astronomer and you want to discover a comet, then what you do is you scan the sky with your telescope you look for something that looks fuzzy, you note its position, and then you check the following night or a couple of nights later, and you see if it's moved. And if it has, you go, yes, I have discovered a comet, and you um, write off to, the, uh, um, to, the body, to the, your local national astronomy body and say, I have discovered a comet. Um, and one of these people who went in for this was Charles Messier, um, he was quite good at this. He has 13 comet discoveries to his name. Um, but what he found was that there exist in the sky annoying fuzzy things that are not comets and not part of the solar system and don't move. And after, I imagine, several frustrating um, fake discoveries where he spotted a fuzzy thing, went back to it a couple of nights later and discovered it was still in exactly the same place, um, he thought, sod it, or being French, never, I will um, catalogue these fuzzy things in the night sky um, and I'll write down where they are and that will mean that I can look them up and check that, and I will stop mistaking them for comets. And so he did that and this is of course the famous Messier catalogue which has been a staple of um, amateur astronomers pretty much ever since. Now, the Messier catalogue is a catalogue of things that can be mistaken for comets. So if you compare it to star catalogues, um, the Messier catalogue is indeed a Messier catalogue. Um, 
it's not really a catalog of things that belong to a well-defined category like stars it's actually things that don't belong to a well-defined category things which are not comets and so if you look at these objects there are 110 of them and if you do a count of what of, of them you find that those 110 objects include 40 galaxies 29 globular clusters 26 open clusters eight diffuse nebulae four planetary nebulae one supernova remnant namely the crab um, one particularly dense bit of the milky way and one random optical double star i don't know what that's doing there um, Wikipedia says that um, a, a nebula had been reported in that area by somebody else and Messier looked for it, couldn't find it and seems to have just added to his catalogue something vaguely interesting in that general area. Um, how you could mistake an optical double for a comet, I really don't know, um, but it's there anyway. Um, so that established that there was a class of things in the night sky that looked fuzzy and those fuzzy things in the night sky became known as nebulae because in those days it was still quite common to um to, to know latin it was something that any educated person would be expected to have learned and nebula is the latin word for a little mist or a cloud and these things looked vaguely like clouds in the night sky, and so they became ne known as nebulae. So, um, moving now from France to England, um, William Herschel made a particular study of nebulae, um, and that's in large part because nebulae are faint objects. You need a large light gathering power to see them, and Herschel um, had bigger telescopes than everybody else um, since he was a very talented maker of large reflecting telescopes. So therefore, he met, that made um, it easier for him to study faint extended objects. Conversely, he couldn't easily do the sort of precision um, astrometry, uh, searching for parallax, that kind of thing. That, um, that people with refracting telescopes could do because large reflecting telescopes are very unwieldy to maneuver so they're not well um, designed for high precision work. So, um, so he made a study of nebulae and he also looked for comets, as did his sister. Um, and he found he could resolve many of Messier's objects into stars. Remember that about half of them are clusters of one kind or another. And initially, he quite reasonably assumed that um, the ones that he couldn't resolve into stars were just further away than the ones that he could resolve, and that everything that was nebulous was, in fact, a distant group of unresolved stars. Um, after a while, after a few years, uh, having studied the Orion Nebula in some detail, um, he changed his mind. He decided that uh, he really couldn't justify viewing the Orion Nebula as being um, uh, unresolved stars, largely because he could in fact resolve some stars in the middle of it, the stars we now call the Trapezium Cluster. And so he decided that there was in fact nebulous matter, cloudy material in space that was not stars. Um, and he continued Messier's tradition of making catalogues of things that are not stars and he was no more discriminating than uh, Messier was in terms of what he catalogued. Um, he made lists of nebulae that were grouped together in fairly random order with, lists, with star clusters. Um, so his catalogues included both um, unresolved cloudy nebulae and resolved star clusters. Um, and he published several papers in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society listing these objects. And those lists extended and enhanced, became um, first in the hands of his son, John Herschel, also a noted astronomer, uh, 
and later of a chap called John Dreyer, the new general catalogue of nebulae and clusters of stars. And the new general catalogue is still alive and well. And any, whenever you look, um, look up an astronomical object and you find that it has a number that starts NGC, um, that is what NGC stands for, New General Catalog. So that is still maintained and updated and is still the probably the um, primary uh, catalog for um, what we would now call galaxies and nebulae and clusters. Oops, I went the wrong way for some reason. Um, so on the left here, you can see a, um, a plate from one of Herschel's papers showing drawings of different types of nebulae. Um, and he was very conscious that there were different types. And with hindsight, we can see that some of his types, particularly the ones down the bottom, um, some of those may actually be unresolved globular clusters, but some of them are, look very, very much as though they are in fact elliptical galaxies. Um, but as, it's very difficult, based on what you can see with the naked eye, to make a clear distinction in the early 19th century, late 18th century, um, between these different types. They seem to sort of grade into one another. Um, what that thing at the, at the top is, I have no idea. Um, what it reminds me of is actually an animal from the Burgess Shale called Anomala caris. Um, so I kind of hereby state that that is, that is named the Anomala caris nebula. Um, <clears throat> I don't know which object it actually is. Um, but uh, in the 1840s, the third Earl of Ross, William Parsons, built an even larger reflecting telescope, the so-called Leviathan of Parsonstown, and he was the first person to recognize that some of Herschel's catalog nebulae appeared to have a sort of spiral shape. And in the middle here is his drawing in the 1840s of M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. And um, to, for comparison, in the lower right, there's a modern photograph of M51. And you can see that, um, that the Earl of Ross um, had a pretty good eye. I mean, his drawing is, is really pretty accurate. He hasn't managed to pick up the, um, the second spiral arm uh, going right out to the left, as you can see in the photograph. But he's, he's got the spiral arms in the right places. He's picked up the companion galaxy. Um, this is a pretty accurate drawing of M51. Um, what it doesn't do, of course, is resolve M51 into stars. So it is still not at all clear um, what the nature of these objects is. The, what we have done, or what the Earl of Ross has done, is demonstrated that there is a category of nebulae um, which have this spiral shape. And from then on, we see references in the literature to the spiral nebulae as being a class. So what are nebulae? So we've seen that Herschel initially thought they were unresolved clouds of stars, but subsequently decided that the evidence for the Orion Nebula didn't support that, that interpretation. Um, it became easier to study this in the second half of the 19th century, because over in Germany, uh, Gustav Kirchhoff and Robert Bunsen set out the laws of spectroscopy. Um, and these laws are that if you have a hot, dense object, such as the sun, or an, the tungsten filament of an old-fashioned incandescent bulb, then if you look at it through a spectroscope, you will see a continuous spectrum, a rainbow. If you, on the other hand, heat up a low density gas, as you do in a fluorescent light, for example, and you look at that through a spectroscope um, and look at a neon sign or something of that nature, 
what you will see is a spectrum consisting of a few bright emission lines which are characteristic of the particular element and that's why old-fashioned sodium street lamps look that funny orangey yellow color um, sodium uh, hot sodium gas produces uh, a close doublet of lines in the orange yellow part of the spectrum and that's basically all you see in a sodium light and that's also why you can't distinguish colors in a sodium light because you're basically being illuminated with monochromatic orangey yellow light. And if you ha take a, a low density gas and you shine a continuous spectrum through that gas, then the gas produces absorption lines, black lines, at the same wavelengths as the emission lines that it produces when it's heated. And this was a key discovery of um, Kirchhoff's um, that the absorption lines in the spectrum of the sun are produced by gas in the solar atmosphere. Um, he found this by accident. He was backlighting a flame spectrum with a solar spectrum to use the solar absorption lines as wavelength standards and found to his um, astonishment that, uh, in fact, when he did that, the emission lines from the gas turned into absorption lines. So um, Kirchhoff's papers uh, inspired astronomers to embrace spectroscopy because it, be it was becoming clear that studying spectral lines gave you insight into the chemical composition of astronomical objects, which was something that had previously been thought completely impossible to, to discover. And in 1864, William Huggins um, found, did this for a number of planetary nebulae, and he picked planetary nebulae because they're nice and bright and easy to identify, and he found that planetary nebulae have, have emission line spectra, and that's one of his spectra on the right there, um, that uh, funny designation there um, with the H in it is actually a, a number from one of Herschel's, one of Herschel Senior's catalogs. Um, and if it has an emission line spectrum, then by Kirchhoff and Bunsen's laws, it must be a hot low density gas. So Huggins have proved that at least one category of nebulae, the planetary nebulae, are basically gaseous. Now it should be said that when you read Huggins's paper, he also looked at the spectrum of M31, the Andromeda galaxy, and he found that the M31 spectrum was not an emission line spectrum, it was a continuous spectrum, um, but despite that, the results from the planetary nebulae did tend to um, convince astronomers that nebulae considered as a class were gaseous objects. Um, and so by the end of the 19th century, or the start of the 20th century, that was basically the mainstream view. And you can see that in a well-known book by Agnes Clerk called A Popular History of Astronomy During the 19th Century. Um, where she wrote um, the conception of the nebulae as remote galaxies, which Lord Ross's resolution of many interst interstellar points that appeared to support, began to withdraw into the region of discarded and half-forgotten speculations. Um, and although Clark was not herself a professional astronomer because she was a woman and it was very difficult in those days for women to be professional anythings, um, she knew and corresponded with the leading astronomers of her day, and it's pretty clear that what she writes in her book is um, a good summary of contemporary professional opinion. So if you'd, uh, if you'd taken an opinion poll of astronomers in around 1900, the general view would have been that all nebulae are gaseous objects um, within the Milky Way. However, um, also at about that time, roughly 1900, technology for astronomical observations has really improved compared to the conditions when Herschel 
was doing his observations at the start of the 19th century. So Herschel was observing with the naked eye. Um, by 1900, photography has taken over. Um, photography got started in the 1830s, but the original early photographic um, uh, technology was not suitable for astronomy because it was extremely slow. Um, you had to take long exposures of even quite brightly lit subjects. That's why Victorian family photographs look so stiff. They basically had to stand still for several seconds while the um, photographer exposed the plate. Um, but in the 1870s, the, um, the, the photographic plate, um, the dry gelatin process um, had been invented. That was much faster. It also used plates that were, as the name suggests, dry. You could prepare them in advance. You didn't have to have a, a chemical laboratory adjacent to your telescope. And so by 1900-ish, photography had really taken over for most applications from naked eye observations. And that, of course, meant that even if your telescope was relatively small, you could do long exposures and look at faint objects. So deep sky astronomy was starting to be a real thing by 1900. Um, as we saw, spectroscopy started in the 1860s. So by 1900, it was an established tool, and the um, Harvard Observatory was busy compiling the Henry Draper catalog with the modern spectral classification of stars. Um, and in the, at the start of the 20th century, we finally saw big silver on glass reflecting telescopes coming into general use as research telescopes. Um, and this is quite a, quite a sharp switch over. In the 1890s, two big, um, rich US observatories, Lick and Yerkes, commissioned large flagship telescopes. And in both cases, they commissioned refractors, um, the 36 inch Lick refractor and the um, 40 inch Yerkes. Um, a few years later, in 1905, um, the Hale 60 inch telescope on Mount Wilson was um, the, probably the, uh, well, second really big research reflector. There was one that was, uh, that was um, built by uh, Poincaré at Marseille, but this is the first really highly productive silver on glass large research reflector. And it's very telling that the same person, um, George Ellery Hale, who commissioned the Yerkes refractor, only a decade later, um, when he was director of Mount Wilson, chose to make his big telescope a reflector. So it was really quite a sharp switchover in the, by the professionals from refractors to reflectors. And reflectors are much better for photography than refractors because they don't suffer from chromatic aberration. So the photographic fo focus, the blue light focus, was the same as the visual focus. So you didn't have to faff about trying to get your plates focused at a place which was different from where, they, where the light was focused for your dark adapted naked eye. So these advances taken together allowed astronomers at, in the early 20th century to make much more detailed studies of nebulae in general and spiral nebulae in particular. And you can see the quality of the photographs they were taking from these images here. On the left is M51 again, this time taken by James Keeler in 1899 with the Crossley reflector at the Lick Observatory, which um, was actually built in England by a chap called um, Andrew Ainsley Common, who won a gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society with it for a photograph of the Orion Nebula. Um, but it was subsequent, he sold it to a, um, an industrialist called Crossley from Yorkshire, in fact. Um, and Crossley, discovering that the skies of Yorkshire were not the ideal place for a large reflecting telescope, um, donated it to the Lick Observatory, where it sat unloved as everybody um, cooed over their shiny new refractor until James Keeler, the director of the observatory, um, recommissioned it and discovered that it was perfect for, for photography. And um, that's one of many photographs of nebulae that Keeler took. Um, in his relatively short 
career, he died quite young of a heart attack in, I think, 1901. Um, in, the, in the middle is a lovely picture of the Andromeda Galaxy by George Ritchie from Mount Wilson. And you can see, looking at that picture, why it was easy to believe that spiral nebulae were gaseous, because that it really does look like smoke um, coming off uh, of a central condensation. And indeed, many people thought that these spiral nebulae were solar systems in the process of formation, with the cloudy bit being what we now call the protoplanetary disk, and the bright blob in the middle being the young star. And that's a completely reasonable interpretation from the appearance of these objects. And finally, on the right is um, M101, uh, also taken by George Ritchie, um, but with the Hale 60 inch on, my, on Mount Wilson. Um, and uh, that photograph is one that will actually play a starring role a little later. Another key observation that was made in the early 20th century was that nebulae, or at least spiral nebulae, move. Um, in 1915 and then later in 1917, um, Vesto Slifer, who was the director of the Flagstaff Observatory in, in Arizona, um, published data on the Doppler shifts of spiral nebulae. And the two facts about this, the fact that he was interested in was that these redshifts were very large, up to over a thousand kilometers per second. And that's much, much bigger than um, the Doppler shifts of any other kind of nebula. Uh, with hindsight, the most important fact about his Doppler shifts is in fact that most of them were redshifts. In 1915, 11, 11 out of the 15 nebulae he had Doppler shifts for were redshifted. In 1917, he'd added another 10 to make 25 in all, and all of those additional 10 were redshifts. Of course, in 1915, um, Einstein had only just published the um, equations of general relativity, so it's not at all surprising that um, Slipher did not um, make uh, as much um, fuss about this predominance of redshifts as with hindsight we think he should have done. Um, so uh, these were very, very large redshifts. They were not um, comparable for, with other classes of nebulae. They were not comparable with stars. Both of those have typical redshifts of a few tens of kilometers per second, not hundreds or thousands. Um, of, the object, of the other classes of objects you might consider, they're most comparable to the Doppler shifts of globular clusters, which are typically about 150 kilometers per second on average and go up to about 300. Um, so even that's quite small compared to over 1,000. So Slipher, um, in 1915, he um, doesn't come out and say anything, but you can tell from his phrasing that he really doesn't think these objects are within the galaxy. By 1917, he's decided to nail his colors to the mast, and he says in the 1917 paper that the so-called island universe theory, that's the theory that um, spiral nebulae are galaxies like the Milky Way, gains favor in the present observations. So um, he was convinced that the um, Doppler shifts he was seeing were not compatible with um, these objects being within the Milky Way. So that brings us to the great debate. Um, so in 1900, there had been a very strong majority in favor of the position that all nebulae were little gassy things within the galaxy. By 1920, doubts had arisen. So the nature of the spiral nebulae was now once again controversial, although most other classes of nebulae were indeed accepted as being part of the Milky Way. And so um, in 1920, the American National Academy of Sciences decided to have a formal debate um, entitled The Scale of the Universe. And the um, proponents of the protagonists of the debate were Heber Curtis, who was the director of the Lick Observatory 
and Harlow Shapley, who was at Mount Wilson, but was um, a, was actually in the process of applying for the job of director of the Harvard College Observatory, which he uh, took up the following year. And this uh, has become known in history of astronomy as the Great Debate. That's not um, Shapley, by the way, is the uh, is on the top of those pictures, and Curtis um, is at the bottom. Um, and uh, calling it the Great Debate is, as is common with these things, um, illuminated by hindsight. Uh, apparently, at the time. Um, it was a pretty low-key affair, and um, it's really the papers that the two wrote afterwards that um, are more significant than the debate itself. So what were the basic positions? Well, in, the, in one corner was Shapley, and Shapley had two essential contentions. One was that the Milky Way is very large, and the sun is a long way from the center, and the other was that spiral nebulae are small objects within the Milky Way. And Curtis, um, on the other hand, his position was that the Milky Way is comparatively small, and that the Sun is a fairly central object within the Milky Way, um, and spiral nebulae are extragalactic objects, and they are entirely comparable to the Milky Way. In other words, the Milky Way is a spiral nebula. So, um, being scientists, they had evidence to support their positions. Um, and here is, and we'll do Shapley's case first. Um, so, Shapley was confident about what he said about the galaxy. Um, he had calculated the distances of globular clusters. Um, based on the Cepheid period luminosity law um, it, discovered uh, in 1912 by Henrietta Leavitt. Um, and what he found was that the center of the globular cluster distribution was, by his calculations, about 20 kiloparsecs from the sun in the direction of the constellation of Ophiuchus. And in this, this diagram, which is from one of his 1918 papers, um, they Dots are positions of globular clusters. The um, black circles are centered on the sun, and they are each 10 kiloparsecs apart. Um, and the uh, dotted circles, or gray circles, um, are centered on 20 kiloparsecs from the sun, which was where he thought the center of the globular di cluster distribution was. Um, and he, con he concluded that the galaxy as a whole was about 100 kiloparsecs, about 300,000 light years in diameter. So a very large object, and the sun is um, quite a long way from the center, although nowhere near the edge. So that was Shapley's case about the galaxy, and as I say, he would have felt himself on pretty firm ground there because these were observations that he had made himself and calculations that he had done himself. Um, he was not himself um, so focused on the spiral nebulae, so here his arguments rested on work by other people. Um, and his arguments, firstly, was that because he thought the galaxy was very, very large, if you claim that other galaxies, that the spiral nebulae are other galaxies of the same size, then that puts them, in his view, unreasonably far away. And furthermore, if you look at the, the, the spiral nebulae, you can measure their surface brightness, that is to say, their brightness per square arc second on the sky, and that is a quantity that does not depend on distance because the further away you go, um, the less light you get per square meter, but the more square meters there are in a square arc second, and the, and the two dependencies are both on the square of the distance and they cancel out. So surface brightness is not dependent on distance. Um, and you can calculate what you expect the surface brightness of the Milky Way to be if you see it from outside, 
and his calculation for the Milky Way was much lower than, the, than what he saw for external spiral nebulae, so he argued that they were not the same type of object. Um, he also noted that spiral nebulae are not seen close to the plane of the galaxy. There is what they call the zone of avoidance um, close to the galactic plane, which is also true of globular clusters. And his argument was that in order to avoid the plane of the Milky Way, you have to know where it is. And so that, that if you know where the plane is, you must be part of the same system. It's not reasonable that objects exterior to the Milky Way would align themselves symmetrically about the plane of the Milky Way. He also um, pointed out that in 1885, uh, a nova had been observed in M31. And this nova, which was given the name S Andromedae, a um, variable star name, um, was entirely comparable in brightness to the brightness of other novae in the galaxy, and therefore it itself must be in the galaxy. Shapley's trump card um, was observations by a friend of his, uh, the Dutch American astronomy, astronomer Adrian von Maanen, and he had um, a few years previous presented evidence that um, M101, which you'll remember, we saw a photograph of by George Ritchie, and in fact, he used that plate along with others, um, could actually be seen to turn in the sky. So it was rotating as seen by motion in the plane of the sky. And you, this is a, um, a picture from his paper um, showing a negative version of uh, one, of, I think it is one of Ritchie's plates, in fact, um, and the arrows are his measured proper motions of the stars. The length of the arrow is proportional to the size of the proper motion, and the orientation of the arrow shows the direction. And so he saw a net rotational motion. Now, it's not unreasonable that galaxies should rotate, but if they were rotating fast enough that it could actually be seen, over a decade or so, because he was comparing photographs taken five to ten years apart, um, then in order for that speed to be physically plausible, that object has to be relatively nearby. If it was really an extragalactic object, then the implied rotation speed would be just not physically reasonable. So that's Shapley's case, and it looks pretty good. Um, what about Curtis' case? Well, Curtis' model of the galaxy was based on measurements of stars rather than globular clusters. And this made the galaxy much smaller. Curtis thought less than 10 kiloparsecs in diameter, so about a tenth the size of Shapley's galaxy, and it placed the sun close to the center. Um, this is a contour map of the galaxy. It's the um, x-axis of the galactic plane, so this is symmetrical around the plane. You can imagine a mirror image of what you see here. This is a little bit later. This is 1922, I think, by Jacobus Captain, but um, it's similar to the model that Curtis was using. Um, so it's significantly smaller than Shapley's galaxy. Captain's model is a bit bigger than Curtis was claiming, but similar order of magnitude and um, the sun is relatively near the center. So when Curtis came to the spiral nebulae, he was therefore interpreting the galaxy as a much smaller object than um, Shapley thought, and therefore his um, galaxy has a higher surface brightness than Shapley's does because it's concentrated in a smaller area. And so, um, to him, interpreting the spiral nebulae as other galaxies was perfectly plausible. The, um, the surface brightnesses were not um, out of line, and uh, putting them at sufficient distance to make them appear the angular size on the sky that they do didn't make them ludicrously far away. So, with his model of the galaxy, that was perfectly reasonable. Um, 
he his interpretation of why they are not seen um, near the galactic plane was that if you look at edge, photographs of edge-on spirals, and um, this photograph is one of NGC 4565, taken by James Keeler in 1901, you can see that there's a dark band that runs down the plane of the galaxy. And um, Keeler said, well, um, it's not physically reasonable that there are no stars there. Uh, that wouldn't be gravitationally stable. Um, even if they were gaseous objects, it wouldn't be gravitationally stable. So that must demonstrate that there is a ring of obscuring material in the plane of this object. And therefore, you won't be able to see through that. If you can't see through it to the stars in the, ga in the spiral nebula, then if you were in the spiral nebula, you wouldn't be able to see through it the other way to see galaxies close to the plane of your nebula. And therefore, um, he argued that spiral nebulae are not seen close to the galactic plane, not because they are not there, but because they are not visible owing to the presence of this obscuring material. And he also used Slipher's Doppler shifts to argue that the spiral nebulae were moving too quickly to be gravitationally bound to the Milky Way. So Curtis best evidence was that um, from 1917 on, people had been looking at plates, photographic plates of nebulae and comparing them with earlier photographic plates of the same nebula and discovering that there were um, transient objects. There were things which suddenly increased in brightness and then faded away again. And this is an Im this is, these are images from his 1917 paper. And on the left is a 1910 image of a particular galaxy. I forgot to write down which one it is. Um, and uh, in 1915, um, here is the same galaxy. And you can see the arrow pointing at a star to the left of the nucleus, which was not present. Um, in the 1910 image, and which in subsequent 1915 images gradually faded away. So he argued that that little dot is in fact a nova, um, and that little dot is a heck of a lot fainter than typical novae observed in the Milky Way, about 10 magnitudes fainter, and 10 magnitudes corresponds to a um, being 10,000 times fainter um, from the inverse square law, that implies that that object is 100 times further away than typical galactic nova, and therefore the, gal the nebula in which that object occurred is 100 times further away than a typical object in the galaxy, and therefore is not in the galaxy. So um, these arguments. Uh, if you listen to either one by itself, they would appear convincing. Um, so when you have the two sets, um, how do you reconcile these conflicting arguments? Well, if you analyze these arguments, you can see that they fall into a number of categories. The best arguments are those which are definitive if they are correct. And chief among these it are actually two of Shapley's points. If Van Manen's results are correct, then the spiral nebulae that he measured can't possibly be extragalactic. Um, it just is not reasonable to reconcile those proper motions with something which is um, further away than the limits of the galaxy. And the only way of countering that is to say, um, yes, if Van Manen's results are correct, that follows, but I do not believe that Van Manen's results are correct. He is mistaken. And this is in fact what Curtis did. Um, he didn't explicitly say that, but he did say that he had conducted similar studies and he had found no evidence of rotational proper motion, which is um, effectively saying Van Manen's just wrong. Um, and the other point which comes into this category is 
that if Shapley is right about the globular cluster distances, then since everybody does agree that globular clusters are part of the Milky Way, um, you can't really maintain support for a small galaxy with the sun near the center if the center of the globular cluster distribution is 20 kiloparsecs away. And Curtis was aware of this, and um, his only recourse was to question the validity of the distance measurements. Um, and he was really not at all convinced um, of the reality of the CFID period luminosity relation. So the second type of argument that you see Curtis and Shapley making is an argument which depends on your interpretation. And the obvious one here is the question of comparison with galactic novae. Now, it, now the phenomenon of what we would now call a classical nova, a nova within the Milky Way, was well understood. Quite a lot of them have been observed. Um, and so if you interpret S. Andromedae, the 1885 event, as a standard galactic nova, and if it genuinely was in M31, um, then it follows that M31 must be inside the galaxy at a typical sort of galactic distance because S. Andromedae's brightness was a typical sort of nova brightness. So in this case, the faint photographic transients that Curtis is observing must be something else. Um, Shapley was not arguing that they were not real. He was arguing that they were not novae. Conversely, if you're Curtis, you accept that the photographic transients are standard novae. And then, equally convincingly, if those are as bright as your typical galactic nova, then since they appear so much fainter, they must be a heck of a lot further away. And in that case, the spiral nebulae definitely have to be outside the um, bounds of the Milky Way. So in this case, S. Andromedae is not a nova. It is either an extremely anomalous and very, 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 very bright object, um, or it's a foreground object that only accidentally happened to take place in front of M31. And the third kind of argument is actually circular. Um, you are assuming what you try to prove. And that is the case with the question of why are there no spiral nebulae near the galactic plane? If you assume that the galaxy is a spiral nebula, then you have photographic evidence that spiral nebulae have obscuring material in the plane. And therefore, you have um, reason to believe that you would not see spiral nebulae at low galactic latitude because of obscuration by this opaque material in the plane. But that argument requires you to assume as a starting point that the galaxy is a spiral nebula, which is what you're trying to prove. Conversely, if you assume that spiral nebulae are not galaxies and the galaxy is not a spiral nebula, then you have no reason to assume that there is obscuring material in the plane of the Milky Way because it, the, Mil the Milky Way is not a spiral nebula, so the observations of obscuring material in the planes of spiral nebulae are not relevant. And therefore, if you have no reason to expect that there is any obscuring material, the only reason for spiral nebulae to avoid the galactic plane is that they know where the galactic plane is, and that means they must be part of the galaxy. So both of those arguments are entirely circular. If you assume what you are trying to prove, then you can prove what you are trying to prove. If you assume the opposite, then you will prove the opposite. They don't actually, they, they are consistency arguments, but they are not proofs of anything. So in 1920, it was actually, with the data on hand, it was basically impossible to decide who was right. Um, you could analyze the arguments, but um, where, who you believed essentially depended on which arguments you were prepared to accept and which you were prepared to reject. There was no objective standard 
for making a decision. And in fact, it took another five years for there to be an objective standard for making a decision. And that occurred in 1925 when Edwin Hubble, using the 100-inch Hooker telescope, which started operation in 1917, um, published measurements of variable stars in M31 and M33. And here you see a plate of M31 in which Hubble has um, has marked a star with, um, with two lines, the stars in the middle of the gap between the lines, and he scribbled bah! the variable on it um, in rather excited handwriting. Um, and these, the key thing about these variable stars was that on the basis of their light curves, Hubble could identify that they were not just any old variable, they were specifically CFID variables. And by using the same CFID period luminosity law, that Shapley had used for the globular clusters, he was able to demonstrate that M31 and M33, which are two of the largest and therefore presumably closest of the spiral nebulae, must be well outside even Shapley's large Milky Way um, with an estimated distance of 285 kiloparsecs. So if anybody's forgotten, and just so that all the photographs of people on, in this talk are not dead white males, um, here, here we have a dead white female. Um, in 1912, um, Henrietta Swan Levitt um, was studying variable stars in the Magellanic Clouds, and she showed that Cepheid variables in the, Magell in the small Magellanic Cloud followed a relationship between the period and the apparent magnitude. That's shown on the right. The fact that there are two curves is down to them being variables. Um, the upper one of those is the uh, apparent magnitude at maximum light, and the lower one is the apparent magnitude at minimum light. These are photographic magnitudes. Um, and she showed that that is a linear relationship, so it's of the form apparent photographic magnitude is equal to A times the log of the period plus B, where A and B are constants. And since the small Magellanic cloud is in fact small, we can assume that all of its stars are at about the same distance from, from the Earth. Um, the variation in, difference is, in distance is small compared to the mean distance. And so that relationship is actually a relationship between period and the intrinsic luminosity of the stars. And what that means is that in principle, if you know the, apparent, the absolute magnitude of any CFID, you can calibrate that relationship and then you have something you can use to determine distances. You measure the apparent brightness of a CFID variable, you compare it with that period luminosity relation, um, and you can determine how far away it is. CFID variables are what cosmologists call a standard candle. Um, they have a known brightness, so by looking at the, how bright they appear, you can work out how far away they are. Of course, in 1912, you couldn't do that because nobody knew how far away the small Magellanic Cloud was, so you couldn't actually calibrate that relation. Um, however, Einar Hertzsprung, here of the hertzsprung russell diagram, was quick to spot the potential significance of Levitt's findings, and in 1913, he actually did publish a calibration of um, the Cepheid distance scale and used it to determine that the small Magellanic cloud in his um, calibration was about um, 10 kiloparsecs away. Um, and Henry Norris Russell and Harlow Shapley made independent calculations um, soon after that. They all used statistical methods because Galactic cephids are rare stars. The closest galactic cephids are not close enough for ground-based parallax. So they had to use statistical methods using proper motion to uh, calculate the average distance of galactic cephids, which they could there, then compare to their average brightness to obtain a calibration for this relationship. And here you can see the plot, the plot that was used by Shapley to um, uh, measure the globular clusters. And on, in this case, unlike the previous plot, you can see that the y-axis is now calibrated in absolute magnitude rather than apparent magnitude. 
So why did that settle the argument? Is this not the same argument that um, Curtis was making with the Nove? The reason that it isn't is that you can't really argue that a Cepheid variable is not a Cepheid variable. Cepheid variables have very distinctive light curves. Here is a light curve for delta Cephi, the um, original Cephid, um, measured by a chap called Joel Stebbins, about whom I know nothing, um, at about this period. And um, you can see that it has this very characteristic um, fast rise to maximum and then slow decline after maximum. Um, and they have very typical periods of a, um, ranging from a few days to a few tens of days. So it's very difficult to argue that the Cephids in M31 and M33, which look like that, are not in fact Cephids. <coughs> Whereas with the photographic novae, typically all you had was knowledge that this object had appeared quite suddenly and had faded away. Um, and you could argue that this was new, some new sort of transient and not actually a real nova because the light curves of nova are not as distinctive as the variation of a Cepheid. Furthermore, Hubble used Shapley's very own calibration, so Shapley couldn't really argue with it. So, um, with hindsight, therefore, Curtis was right about the status of the spiral nebulae. So we can look back with hindsight on those great debate arguments and see why the two people, both of whom were very competent astronomers, um, disagreed so strongly on um, the scale of both the galaxy and the wider universe. Um, so the first thing we can ask is why did Shapley and Curtis disagree on the size and shape of the galaxy? And here it's important to note, it's quite commonly said in books that Shapley was right and Curtis was wrong. That's not true. They were actually, neither of them was right, but Shapley was unquestionably less wrong. Um, and they were both wrong for the same reason. Both of them assumed that interstellar space is empty, so that as light is emitted from a star, it just spreads out, fills out a wider and wider area, and therefore the uh, number of photons per square meter decreases according to the square of the distance. And if we put that into magnitude language, we find that the apparent magnitude is given by the absolute magnitude plus five times the log of the distance in units of 10 parsecs. Now, this is in fact wrong. The interstellar space is not empty, it contains dust, and that dust scatters and absorbs light, and therefore stars appear fainter than this law would predict. So if you use this law, then you, you overestimate the distance to the star. Um, Shapley was less wrong than Curtis because he was looking at high galactic latitudes where there's less dust because dust is concentrated in the galactic plane. So all of his distances were too large by something like a factor of two or three, um, but he had the shape right. What Curtis was doing was essentially the equivalent of standing near one end of a very long street lit by street lamps in dense fog. Um, what you see is the light of the street lamps fading away symmetrically on either side of you. So um, for all you can tell, you're at the center of the road because you see equal numbers of street lights fading away. Um, and the, you can't see the more distant lights at all. So you underestimate the length of the road. And if you come back to the road on a clear night, you find that in fact, you were quite close to one end of the road and the street lights stretch out um, for a mile to your left and only a hundred yards to your right. Um, but you couldn't see that in the fog because the more distant lights were observed, were obscured. And that was what you would see, what um, the Starcount people were experiencing 
because they were observing stars and stars are concentrated in the other plane of the Milky Way. So the other definitive observation was Van Manen's rotation. And as I said, um, in order to, um, for spiral nebulae to be genuinely um, extragalactic, that observation had to be wrong. So why did Van Manen, who was a respected astronomer, observe rotation in M101? The short answer is we don't know. But the most likely explanation is that in this difficult measurement, he saw what he expected to see. And this is a very well-known phenomenon. And this is why, whenever possible, um, you try to do uh, to arrange experiments so that you don't know what the measurements are telling you until the very last stage, because it is all it is only too easy to um, see what you think you ought to see. And one thing that I didn't draw your attention to when I showed this picture before um, is the scale bar at the bottom, which tells you the scale of those arrows. And that scale bar, if you can read it, and I know it's small print, um, they were dreadful in the early 20th century for labeling their diagrams in minute print. Um, but that line says, um, that line at the, in the red circle is point is that length of that line is 0.1 arc seconds per year. So given that he was looking at photographs taken um, between five and ten years apart, he was looking at shifts that were at most one arc second, which is the same size as the image of a star. And those objects in M101 are not star-like points; they are slightly fuzzy blobs. So he was actually seeing those objects shift by less than their own diameter. Um, and in order to measure that shift, he had to align those plates using reference stars. And he was comparing plates taken on the same telescope, but several years apart and doubtless with different seeing conditions. So this is a very, very difficult measurement. It's a measurement on the limits of what is possible. And we know from bitter experience that when people make measurements that are at the limits of what is possible, they quite frequently are unconsciously biased by what they expect to see. Um, Van Manen expected to see rotation. These things look as though they should rotate. And so he did see rotation. These plates were re-measured after 1925 and nobody could see any rotational proper motion at all. But of course, that's also biased because they then knew that these objects are far away. So they knew they shouldn't see any rotation. It's not entirely surprising that they didn't. So the next question is, what was S Andromedae? It can't have been a galactic nova because we've established that, um, that they Novae in M31 were the faint photographic objects. So it could have been a foreground object, but um, in fact, it wasn't. In fact, S Andromedae was a supernova. And the odd thing is that supernovae were only recognized as being a separate category of thing in 1934 on the back of two papers by Walter Bader and Fritz Ficke. And the reason I say that's odd is that it was perfectly obvious with 2020 hindsight um, from the data available in 1920 that there were two distinct classes of novae. Um, so in this plot, which I made myself, but I made it based on papers, uh, catalogs of novae and um, X and novae and, and transients in spiral nebulae um, that were published before 1920. Um, that the hashed histogram is novae um, in the Milky Way. And um, the directions of the hashes um, just distinguish between visual ones and visual measurements and photographic measurements. And the solid blue are um, alleged novae in spiral nebulae as catalogued ironically by Shapley. Um, and what you can see 
is that there are two um, objects uh, in spiral nebulae, S. Andromedae and Z. Centauri, which was 1890-something, um, that are anomalously bright. They are about seven magnitudes brighter than the faint photographic objects um, round about magnitude 15 or so. But the key point is that when you look at historic measurements of galactic novae, you see exactly the same pattern. There are two objects stuck out there about seven magnitudes brighter than everything else. And they are Tycho's nova of 1572 and Kepler's nova of 1604, and they are both, with modern classifications, supernovae. So that gap, um, there's admittedly one object of magnitude zero, which slightly muddles up the galactic gap, but presumably it was an exceptionally close nova. But the vast bulk of galactic novae are separated from Tycho's and Kepler's novae by just about the same amount as the vast bulk of, galactic tra of extragalactic transients are separated from S. Andromedae and Z. Centauri. So it was perfectly possible to plot those data. They could draw graphs in 1920 and say, oh, look, there are two classes of novae. Um, one person actually mentioned this in the 1920s, a Swedish guy called Knut Lundmark, who seems to have um, had several ideas that were a bit ahead of his time, um, but nobody else paid any attention, and I don't really know why. So, lastly, why did Hubble get his distance wrong? Uh, you'll remember that I said that he found the distance of M31 and M33 to be very similar and about 285 kiloparsecs. And that's wrong by about a factor of three. Um, modern distance estimate for M31 is 776 kiloparsecs. So why was Hubble's distance wrong? Um, if you read pretty much any textbook, you will be told that this is because um, the kind of Cepheid that occurs in globular clusters Population two Cephids or W Virginis stars are different from the kind of Cephid that appears in the disk of the galaxy, population one Cephids or classical Cephids. Classical Cephids are about one and a half magnitudes brighter for the same period as W Virginis stars, and one and a half magnitudes corresponds to a factor of four in uh, brightness or a factor of two in distance. So that's, uh, that accounts for much of the error in the distance. However, this can't possibly be right, because despite the fact that it's found in textbooks, don't believe everything you read in textbooks, because Shapley calibrated his period luminosity curve based on Cepheids in the disk of the galaxy, nearby Cepheids that he could get statistical parallaxes for. And those are classical Cepheids. And he then applied that to the globular clusters. So he should have got the globular clusters wrong and the spiral nebulae right. Um, he should not have got the spiral nebulae wrong because of this um, difference in type. That should have made the globular clusters wrong. So the explanation that's in the books is wrong. Um, in fact, the error seems to have been one of these cases where there were a number of things which all acted in the same direction. The most important was that, the, as with the models of the galaxy, the interstellar absorption was not taken into account, and the interstellar absorption was worse for the calibration sample because they were in the galactic disk and therefore where all the dust was. Um, and so the uh, when Hertzsprung and Shapley and Russell uh, calibrated the period luminosity curve. Um, their brightness estimates for the galactic Cephids were too faint, whereas the um, W Virginis stars in globular clusters, they were also too faint, but less badly affected because they were at high galactic latitudes. And therefore, by sheer coincidence, um, their estimate for the brightness of galactic Cephids was closer to W Virginis stars than it was to the actual brightness of classical Cephids. <coughs> and the second point is that the calibration was just wrong. Uh, 
In other words, the average distance that Hertzsprung, Russell and Shapley had all independently calculated um, used a method called secular parallax, which relies on um, accurately measured proper motions and relies on the assumption that the peculiar motions of stars are randomly oriented. And basically what you're saying with secular parallax is that the motion that you see in a, um, of a star has two components. One is the real motion of the star itself, and the other is the motion of the sun, the fact that you are observing from the solar system, which is a moving platform. And if you look at many stars and you average out, if their motions are all random in direction, they'll cancel out. And the only thing that you have left is the effect of the sun's motion. And so uh, you know the sun's motion in kilometers per second. So if you measure it, if you measure the proper motion, the average proper motion in arc seconds per year, then the conversion factor between those two um, involves the average distance of the object, so therefore you get the average distance. Um, so you need accurate proper motions. But the proper motions that they had, which they thought were accurate, were not as well measured as they thought they were. Um, and the other thing you need is that the star's motions will all cancel out. Um, and in fact, they do not all cancel out because of the effects of the rotation of the galaxy. And of course, at the time, nobody knew that the galaxy did rotate and certainly didn't know how fast it rotated. And so they, didn't, they couldn't correct for that effect because they didn't know it was there. Um, so the combination of those meant that their distances were not right. The neglect of interstellar absorption meant that their brightnesses were not right. Um, and as a consequence, a consequence of that, their calibration was not right. Um, and it's really not dependent on the fact that cephids in globular clusters are different from cephids in the, in the galactic plane. The embarrassing thing is that they could have got that much more right, because although the existence of interstellar absorption was only really accepted as a result of um, observations by Robert Trumpler in 1930, where he was looking at open clusters in the galaxy. Uh, there were several other studies, embarrassingly including one with Shapley as a co-author, which had concluded that interstellar absorption did in fact exist. Um, and an example of this, um, in 1914, well before 1920, chap called Edward King, about whom again, as with Joel Stebbins, I know nothing, um, had analyzed a correlation between apparent magnitude and color index for stars of a given spectral class. Um, and he concluded um, that all indications point to the presence of an absorbing medium in space. And he'd estimated that the absorption in the visible band was about 1.9 plus minus 0.7 or so, magnitudes per kiloparsec, which is actually slightly bigger than modern estimates, which would be around one magnitude per kiloparsec, but it's, um, it's consistent within the error bars. Um, so if people have paid proper attention to this work, and as I say, one of the papers that agreed with King's measurements was one that had Shapley as a co-author, um, then the early distance estimates would have been properly corrected for absorption Shapley would have got the size of the galaxy right. Curtis might have understood why his model of the galaxy differed from Shapley's, and early cosmology might have made a lot more sense. It's amazing how good hindsight can be in these things. So, of course, um, my title was The Birth of Cosmology, and um, the immediate aftermath of the measurement, the ability to measure distances of galaxies, wrongly, but they didn't know that, um, was uh, that in 1929, Hubble combined a distance ladder that was based on Shapley's calibration of Cepid variables, Doppler shift measurements, which he does not credit. Honestly, the more papers of Edwin Hubble's I read, the less I like the man. He seems to have been distinctly unwilling to give credit to anybody but himself. Um, but anyway, um, 
he used these Doppler shift measurements, many of which were slifers, and some seem to have been Mount Wilson measurements by a chap called Pease, um, to produce a velocity distance plot. Um, it's often presented in popular accounts as though this came as a great shock. It didn't. Um, other people, like Knut Lundbach, had attempted this before, but because they had even more rubbish distance estimates, the results had not been very convincing. So Hubble was looking for a relationship between velocity and distance, um, but he uh, actually found one because his distances, although they were wrong, they were all wrong by the same factor. So you still get a straight line, it's just got the wrong, wrong gradient. Um, and so he was able to show that um, the velocity as measured by the Doppler shift was proportional to the distance. Um, admittedly, the 1929 data, which I've shown here, um, are not terribly convincing. Um, but a couple of years later, he, with Milton Humerson, published a much larger sample going out to greater distances. And then it's very, very clearly a straight line. And also in the 1920s, um, uh, Alexander Friedman and Georges Lemaitre had independently produced the solutions of Einstein's field equations of general relativity that um, demonstrate that you expect the universe to expand. So if you put those two together, which Hubble didn't because he didn't know about Friedman's work, which was mostly published in Russian, and he didn't know about Lemaitre's work, which was A in French and B published in that well-known bestseller, The Annals of the Scientific Society of Brussels, um, which was just as obscure then as it is now. Um, so uh, Hubble didn't know about these theories, um, although Lemaitre did know about Slifer's redshifts. Um, but when these were put together in 1931, when Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington got Lemaitre's paper translated, and published in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, which is a bestseller, um, then uh, that, those two things put together mark the birth of modern cosmology. So from about the 1931 onwards, you have a recognizable science of cosmology um, using the same theoretical tools that we use today. So to summarize, what I've tried to show is that our modern view of the universe was largely constructed in the 1920s. It's only about a century old. Um, and I've shown that its birth was not without complications, that it took some time to get things right. Um, and it could have been easier. With hindsight, we can see that many of the delays and many of the wrong turns and the um, misguided opinions could have been avoided using data that were available at the time. Um, if early catalogues of nebulae hadn't been a grab bag, a bag of rubbish but had been more organized, um, the distinction between spiral nebulae and other types might have been made earlier. It could have been made at any time after 1864 because it was known from, eight, from the 1860s onwards that the spectra of spiral nebulae were very different from the spectra of other kinds of nebulae. If early papers on interstellar absorption had been better publicized and had gained general acceptance, then early distance scales would have been less wrong. And we wouldn't have had the embarrassing situation that we have with Hubble's Hubble diagrams, that because his value of his constant was so large, you actually, they actually implied that the Earth was older than the universe. Um, and if people had just looked at their data, they should have been able to recognize the distinction between novae and supernovae. They should have been able to see that there were two classes of bright transients, and one of them was about six or seven magnitudes brighter than the other one. Um, so what this story tells us is that Although we do get to the right answer eventually, because we do keep looking at data, scientists are only human, and you can't expect them to be right all the time. Thank you very much. Yeah.
That was uh, really interesting. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, when does the word galaxy appear in the language? Um, it's not present in the 1930s. Um, Hubble called his, uh, his book on, um, on galaxies the realm of the nebulae. Um, I think I think it was, it started to come into uh, into use in the 1940s. I think. Right. Thank you for that. Could I ask you to uh, stop transmitting your screen? Yep. Okay, and then I will stop spotlighting you as well. Uh, if I go and should we we should be back to seeing everybody now what we usually do is I ask people uh, for questions and I ask them to put their hands up so that uh, we don't have a mad rush uh, for those people who are doing it the old-fashioned way and have got a keyboard you can cancel your muting temporarily by just holding down the space bar okay so uh, if you have a question, can you put your hand up? Okay, we've got Phil first. Hi, Sue. Hello. Hi, nice to see you. I've not seen you for a long time. Hope you're okay. Yep, yep, I'm okay. fine. Uh, listen, while, while Gary and Tony try to think of a, 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 an inspirational question, I've just got one thing to say. You know when you're doing on Zoom, when you're doing your presentation, the, uh, there's, a, there's a, like a margin at the top and the bottom of the screen so it kind of cuts some of your presentation out and, and you look like the queen on a postage <laughs> stamp on an envelope so <laughs> some of your presentation is like yeah. missing in the top corner oh, but, yeah. but, but no, that's fantastic yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know the, the photograph of m51 uh, yep. it, I'm, I'm sure that's the one they use in the burnham's book it, I, I've seen that quite used quite a few times. Is 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 that the same photo from the um, uh, from, from the it, observatory? It, it probably um, the photograph of M one hundred and one uh, that I showed was by Ritchie from the Mount Wilson, but Van Marnen used two sets of photographs. One, one set were a pair taken by Ritchie, and the other set were indeed taken by um, Keeler at the lick so yeah, yeah. Um, i'm sure it's the same uh, photo yeah. so it very well might be the same photo yeah okay anyway nice to see you thank you phil uh peter peter yeah. jowatsky yeah that's me uh hi so uh, hi. I just have a, nice to see you again uh, i just have a simple question about cepheids it's a while since i've uh, read up anything about them what physical characteristics is it about a star of uh, that mass range that makes them diff different from a normal star for the pulsation is it because they're transitioning off the main sequence or what? um no uh they are in fact um helium burning supergiants and what it is is that normally stars are kept stable by a series of negative feedback loops but if they try to expand they cool that causes them to cool down a bit, which reduces the outward pressure, which makes them contract again. Um, in stars in the instability strip, at a critical distance from the center of the star, there is a layer in which ionized helium is, um, is, is transitioning between two ionization states. I forget now whether it's neutral going to singly ionized or whether it's singly ionized going to doubly ionized. Um, but the result of that is that um, if is that the opacity, the variation of opacity with temperature goes the wrong way, because effectively what you've what you've got is equivalent to latent heat. That if any energy goes into this layer, it doesn't go into heating the layer up; it goes into increasing the amount of ionisation. And the result of that is that um, the negative feedback system gets disrupted. So if a star expands, it over expands beyond the stable limit and then it contracts again and it over contracts. And so that pushes it out again. So it, um, it settles into the pulsation 
and um, it pulsates at its resonant frequency. So it's, it's basically like a woodwind instrument. Yeah, I suppose not every star will become a, a cepheid. Is no, that... no, they have to be, um, cepheids are massive stars. They're sort of a few solar masses, five or so solar masses. Our, our sun will not become a cepheid, yeah. it's not massive enough. Oh, what I meant to, even if a mass, if a star is in that mass range, what is there about it for it to become a, a cepheid? I don't mean the mechanism. Uh, does that mean every star in that mass range will become one when it evolves? Um, it will become one temporarily. It happens in a transition stage. If you think about the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, it's um, it's when they are transitioning um, from the uh, I think it's from the horizontal branch to the um, asymptotic giant branch they will pass through the instability strip in fact a more massive star because the more massive stars their evolutionary tracks they basically go backwards and forwards across the top of the HR diagram they can actually become a cepheid three times at three different periods wow. in their lifetime wow. thank you Thanks. Okay, Peter. Has anybody else got a question? Give me time to just scroll through. Anybody else with a question? I should say to Peter that um, Polaris is a cepid, yes. and it's and it's right on the edge of the instability strip, and it's almost stopped being a cepid. Its pulsation, its um, uh, amplitude of variation is minuscule. It's hundredths of a magnitude. What's the star's name again? Polaris, the pole star. Polaris, Polaris, right. Uh, Roy Gunson, can you un ask, uh, unmute you? I'm, I'm, should be unmuted. Okay. I can hear you. Good. Uh, it's just an observation on uh, Van Marlen and uh, Shapley. I believe when Van Marlen had done the photograph and, done, uh, and worked out the rotational speed of uh, M51, he wrote a rather gloating letter to Shapley to say he'd finally put to bed the idea that these spiral nebula were outside the galaxy. Yep, yes, there's no, there's no doubt that he did expect to find rotation, and I think that is, in fact, the explanation of why he did. And there's a rather plaintive note from Shapley after, um, after Hubble's observations, which uh, where he was asked by somebody or other why he had accepted Van Marnen's observations and he basically said, oh, Van Marnen was my friend. <laughs> uh, I don't see anybody. So um, what I'm going to say now is, uh, can we give our usual thanks uh, over Zoom? It's a bit quiet, but never mind, you'll get used to it, Sue. Can we say thank you to Sue in our usual manner, please? 